So far, we have talked about how to track a point and how to track a bigger area while considering a parameterized image warping. What if we do not have a parameterized warping? Or what if we do not know exactly how to warp from one image to the other? Here we can consider mean shift method. So the co core idea of mean shift is to maximize similarity between tracks and target regions through evolution towards higher density in a parameter space. So the key points here is it's still an iterative method, but we will first define a parameter space so that we can iteratively adjust our alignment in that parameter space. Um, it can handle a non-parameter non distribution through sampling. That is, we do not need to know the exact formulation for that parameter space, and we only need to adjust our model uh, based on samples in that space. And the goal and the reason that they call the mean shift is in this algorithm, a mean or center location is iteratively updated by moving it to the centroid of pixels within a chosen radius or within a region of interest. Uh, let's look at the algorithm in a different perspective. Say um, you have a mode and in this uh, your distribution like this, as you may recognize, this is actually a logo of uh, MATLAB. But let's for now assume that this is the similarity distribution and you have a target image and initially uh, on the source image which, on which you want to map to a target image, you find that you are at a, like you are in this location. And then our goal would be climb towards the center or the mode of this distribution so that so that the center of our machine will be aligned with the maximum point with of this distribution. And again, so here we are we assume that we do not know we uh we do not know the actual distribution in this parameter space, which will be very likely to uh be very comp very complicated and we may not be able to obtain obtain it in any way. However, sometimes we can easily get a sam sample, get samples of that distribution or that measurement. And assuming that initially we are um, in this location, this is our region of interest in this space. And you can see that within that region, we will have a set of points and distributed in this region. And if we calculate uh, the, the center of the mass from this in this region, we will find that it's actually not exactly at the center of our circle. Um, it's, in a, it's in a shifted location just because the mass is imbalanced in that area. And then we can address our center to that real center of mass so that we shift our circle to that region. And then we can iteratively do that, do this shifting again, so that we can keep updating our center until we reach the mode of this distribution. And typically this search only take a few iterations um, because um, in the case that we are treating a high frame rate video and the movement of the object is not very big. And if we want, uh, in the case that there will be a significant change and we want to have a higher chance to find the mode of this distribution, we can initialize our region of interest multiple times within the whole distribution and we can and then pick a location where many of the circles converge to.
the choice of the feature space um can can be multiple, or you you can either choose to use the original color pixels to represent the uh region, or to represent your current target image, or you can use grayscale image, and those image will suffer the contrast change. In the case, in which case the gradient of the image will be more robust. And here we can see uh, some examples. And this is an example of tracking this person. And you can see that we, uh, when the person walk from left to right, we can still see, we can still find it, find him. And even if the person sits down, we can still, we can still track it robustly. And here is the case where the person is partially occluded. And even if the person has some uh, post change, we can still <laughs> track it within this video. Here is another example. Um, this is a toy example of using uh, analyzing the video footage from captured by a zone. And you can see here that even if the zone is very shaking, and we can still use mean shift to check the target building. And here uh, we extract the features from a, from a rectangle box. And here is a successful example to track the uh, play, football players. And the, we can see that it's moving in the field. And if we know the plane for the 2D field, then we can even draw the, the tra trajectory of that player. And that can be used to analyze the movement of different players and understand their strategy. So in summary, uh, we can use MeShift to track a general region, and it's uh, basically a most searching method in a feature space. So far, we have been considering methods that do iterative updates. The assumption there is uh, we are not far away from our initial guess of the parameter space. Either it's only a translation of a point or template, like uh, we assume it has, a, which, where we only assume a small translation, or a full parameter space, where we assume that we have a good initial guess for the parameters. And what if we do not have very good guess at all the target objects undergone very dramatic change within the image? so that it would be very hard to match the uh, appearance. And here, uh, we, can t we are going to talk about tracking by detection, where we will try to detect the, object, detect the targets from the image. And the rough idea goes like this. Um, given a template, here uh, we have an object on the reference image. And we can first extract the features that are environment to certain deformation so, so that on a target image, we can still reliably find it. And let's take this as an example. Say we have a reference image we want to track. And here we have a test image where the target object is only taking place a small area within the test image. And there are, you can see that the test image is very cluttered. And there are just a lot of other distractions. And 
if we directly use our iterative update method, and we it will be very challenging to find the results and or to find the correct matching. Here, uh, we can first detect key points that are invariant to scale rotation or other perspective uh, deformations, and we. In this illustration, we can first detect the 100 strongest feature points in the reference image, and we happen to detect another 300 strongest feature points in the test image. And we uh, please notice that we are using the same detection methods for the reference uh, for the key points, so that uh, we know they can be invariant between within reference and target test image. And for each uh, key points, we will first build some feature descriptors to describe those key points. And so, and in the end, we will aggregate those descriptors together so that we can do a search of the features in the uh, in the test or reference image. And remember that if we directly use the color to describe the key points. It can be really confusing because the in the color space is really very easy to find the objects or pixels of the same color but re representing very different things. And it's actually there has been actually a long history of research uh, that we work on this feature descriptor so that we can design the descriptor that make it uh, more and more distinctive and invariant to different perspective changes. And as you may know, recently we have been focusing on using neural network to learn those features and descriptors automatically. And we will discuss those later in the deep learning lectures. And here, uh, I like to introduce several uh, features that we have designed and proved to be used um, very successfully in our computer vision literature. And one example of them is the history uh, histogram of oriented gra gra gradients, and is called a Hawk for short. And the Hawk feature is a rotation environment feature descriptor. We basically uh, divide the patch or divide the template into several regions and within each small region we will describe we will extract the gradient distribution and we will merge those all those uh, orientation distribution together and put them into a general bin and as you can see here in our examples uh, even if we use our gradient of orientation of gradient to represent the uh, patch but we can still see say a face from the gradient field or a whole person in the gradient field and this hawk features has been used extensively in object detection before the deep learning area and it has a because it has a lot of very nice features. For example, uh, the object shapes are usually uh, defined by edges, and because Hog extracts all the gradient features from objects, we and we have already learned the gradient is a very important tool to detect the edges. And no matter how we rotate the objects, and we we can still get the same hog feature as you can see from the illustration on this slide. And you sh we should notice that even if the objects have some color change, um, say we change the background color, the uh, hog feature will still look the same. And in terms of tracking objects, we also use a lot of other features that are uh, more descriptive, um, but probably harder to compute. For example, people have been using SIFT successfully even to this day to, for, for feature detection and matching, and use the SIFT matching to 
who do 3D reconstruction. And this is mean uh is a very powerful feature, and people have been using it for the whole past twenty years. Um, in terms of in area of 3D reconstruction, and sometimes when we want to match some simple pattern, uh, see if it may be too expensive. And then, uh. We have surf, which kind of a simplified version of Swift, but it is uh, much easier uh, and much faster to compute. And people's desire for speed never end. And later we have faster feature, which still detect the corner uh, like area, but use and but use a more descriptive uh, representation to represent those uh, corner like areas. And we can use and we can use those features to, uh, faster features to match the object. And after we extract those key point descriptors, and give a new image, we can, uh, have its own features, and we for each feature from the new image, we can map it to all the features in the database. Or all the detected, um, detected regions or key points, and then we may find the best matching for that query features, and we can do this for the all the query features in a new image. And sometimes we will want to uh, accelerate the key point matching procedure, and you, and we have multiple ways of doing that once. Uh, one thing is if you feature dimension is not too high, usually <coughs> we can construct a KD tree of the feature space so that we can reduce the complexity of feature searching. And if you have a lot of features, KD tree may still be <coughs> not fast enough. And even worse, KD tree suffer a curse of dimension. And at very high, if we have very high dimensional features, it may not accelerate our uh, feature matching procedure, and therefore people have designed various various approximate approximate nearest neighbor search, so that even in high dimensional feature space, we can still find the feature matching very efficiently, even though sometimes we uh, sacrifice some accuracy. And besides those uh, tree structure or nearest neighbor search, people can have also designed various hashing schemes um, to accelerate the nearest neighbor search. And of course, uh, with, the with the availability of the current massive parallel computing structure like a GPU, um, we can even just compute the distance of a feature vector on a GPU on multiple streaming cores and without borrowing a bot, uh, speed up the search, speed up the matching, because we can compute the matching from features to all the other features at the same time. And after matching the feature descriptors, we will always have some outliers. As you can see here, uh, most of the features are matched fr correctly from the target object. To the test image, but some of our features are still misle misled by the background. And to figure out those, uh, which features are uh, correctly matches, which features are which matches are false positive, uh, we can use our uh, additional outlier elimination procedure. The key idea is. Um, that we can assume most of the key point features are matched correctly, and we can take a majority vote from all the feature matching, and then the majority vote should always, uh, the majority of the matching should give us the correct transformation or can give us the correct answer. And usually we can use ransack combined in combination of certain transformation um, hypothesis to figure out what which matchings are which matches are correct. Uh, in summary, uh, in this tracking by detection scheme, 
we first detect the key points and then build descriptor for those key points. And then we can search in the database or search in the group of key points repre representing the target. And then we can use uh, geometric verification. Basically use RANSEC together with a hypothesis for transformation in order to figure out which matchings are correct. This is very similar to the matching scheme we use for three direct construction. And if you have a 2D template or 2D target, then it's very easy to uh, say use a homography to represent your trans transformation without um, reconstructing the full 3D information of your template. And here are some examples to demo the robustness of this tracking by detection method. Uh, as you can see here, uh, we have a very beautiful picture and we can use features to track the target and at the same time we can augment some objects on this target or on this detect picture in the actual video. And at the same time, um, in the video we are also showing different um, stats to track the objects, like how many points, feature points we actually find and how long they take and how many outliers, layers we find and how long those procedures take. Here is another example. Um, and assuming that we have a pattern that we already know and we want to put a castle uh, in this on this pattern. And you can see that the method is robust to strong uh, movement and the strong um, both in terms of velocity and also the magnitude of uh, transform, transformed angles. And here is some large, change, large scale change. And the good thing about this tracking by detection is even if the target does not appear in some of the frames, we can still relocate them when the target reappears. And this method is also robust to this uh, occlusion. In summary, we can do search by detecting the target object in the testing image and use features to search for the object instead of doing iterative updates. And this use, this use of descriptive features can make our methods more robust and make it even robust to occlusion and the potential change of uh, perspectives and other type of distortions. And there's also a drawback. So it may be slower than the other iterative methods in high frame video because it doesn't make use of this temporal information very well. So let's switch our gear a little bit and consider the case that we are tracking objects of a known category, but we do not have a exact templates here. And in this case, we are uh, required to detect objects independent of each frame. In this case, it means that uh, we may have a general model for the object, but we do not have a particular identity for the object. Say I want to detect the person, and I just tell you that I want to detect, detect and track the person within the videos, and there may be a lot of persons in the video. And then in this case, we will first detect the objects and associate the object together over time into tracks. So as this 
uh, figure is illustrating across time, so we want to detect and track the target object. And we may have multiple objects in the track, which will bring this problem in, uh, much more challenging. Say we have two persons in this video, and our task would be to detect all the per detect the both of both persons in all the frames at the same time. We associate associate them correctly, and we may even be a. Uh, uh, required to deal with more complicated things like here, we may have the more than ten or twenty objects within the frame, and we need to track all of them together. So detecting objects has been discussed in the previous uh, lecture. Basically, we can use supervised learning, and in combination with a large uh, large set of data and labels to tell the model what are uh, the objects we want. And so with those positive and negative examples, uh, our supervised learning methods will be able to learn how to find those um, how to find those positive examples in a new image. And usually we uh, use a black box model <laughs> to learn that how to detect those objects. And as you may know, modern detectors based on convolutional networks can detect the object very accurately in a new image. And sometimes we can also re achieve a good, very good balance between accuracy and efficiency. After we detect an object, we will need to associate them together and track them across time. There are currently primarily two ways of associating the objects. The first thing is we can learn an appearance model to measure the similarity directly. And this has also been commonly used in the traditional tracking by detection literature. And another way of ach achieving this would be given an, um, given an object in the first frame or given some other proposal in the second frame. Using those information, we can detect its motion all in the future frames and then use this motion information to associate the object. And the object um, association is the most critical part in tracking multiple objects and therefore it should receive a lot of attention. And especially recently, because of the increased popularity of video analysis and the availability of video data. So we will talk more about those trends in the deep learning part, since uh, because given uh, those more powerful descriptive models, we, uh, the balance or the um, importance of different methods actually change. People have tried a lot of discriminative learning methods for detecting and associating objects like uh, KN, K nearest neighbors, and logistic regression. And about around 20 years ago, the methods of decision trees and CVM became very popular because, because of their nice proven properties and practical effect, effectiveness. And around 10 years ago, when deep learning became uh, more and more popular, so people just gradually shift their attention to deep learning models. But the core is still the same. We want to build a descriptive learning uh, models so that we can solve those tr core tracking tasks. And besides those um, learning models and the signal for detect local locating and associating objects, Sometimes uh, some uh, more space-time analysis is very important. For example, after we have all the decisions uh, of detecting objects, some of the objects may be missed on some of the frames because, say, because of their occlusion or because their weak confidence for detection. And by an analyzing the location of the objects, and in both space and time, 
we may be able to recover and some of the missing objects. And for example, we will we will perform space time of volume analysis to find out that which objects are uh, appear in the same track, and we may make multiple hypotheses for object tracks. And here is an example. So on this street, we can detect a lot of vehicles, as uh, shown by the bounding boxes. And you can see that it's actually quite flicker. This is a detector a uh, long time ago, and some of the objects are easily missed by the detector. And here, uh, with the powerful space-time analysis, we can see that uh, we can track those objects very reliably. And even though that in detecting those objects on each individual frame, um, we may miss some of them. But if we put all the frames together, we can achieve more robust object localization. And here are some more examples. Basically, for each um, for each of tracked objects, we can also analyze some additional properties within the bounding box. For example, we can see the orientation of the uh, walking directions. And here, this analysis of vehicle and pedestrian trajectories is more useful for autonomous driving systems. So in summary, uh, now we have discussed the track by model. Basically, with, instead of knowing an exact object or template we want to track, we represent the target by a model, and we first detect the object in the video, and then perform space-time analysis and association to track the object together. Now let's talk about a more interesting technique of building models in the case of tracking with a detector. We can actually learn a more accurate appearance models online when we see more and more positive examples in the video. So basically, when, when we are given a template, we probably only have one example of the target object. It may not be enough to construct a very strong model. In any, anyhow, we can learn a model given the current object appearance and its background. And say this is our uh, target, and we want to track this lovely fish. And we will have some uh, background to construct our positive one and the next examples. Then we can learn boundary to separate those two cases, so that our new image we can find this same um, target target object. And on the same image, after after we find this lovely ob object, then we can put it in our training data. And when we at the same time, we can have more active training data. As you know, for learning models, the more example you have, the better the model you can learn. And then with these more uh, examples, we can probably learn a more complicated boundaries or a more accurate boundaries to separate the positive and the negative examples, so that inherently we are building more accurate detectors. Let's look at this loop in uh, action. So here, uh, say we want to track this object, and then on the next time frame, we find a new positive examples. And in order to achieve that, we will evaluate our uh, matching or our detectors on, on the new image in a sliding window fashion. And after we 
uh, do this uh, sliding window, we are able to build a new confidence map, say on this new image, uh, at each location, how confident we are seeing a new object. And then after we find a new object location, we can update the classifier with our new examples so that we can uh, just use these small models to build a better and better detectors. And here are some uh, examples to illustrate the, this online, uh, the results of this online updating. You can see that, um, say, on the video on the, in the, on the left, even if the human, uh, the person's face has uh, gone through very large illumination change, just because we have uh, keep updating the models, and the model have also gradually adapt to the new illumination, and therefore in the new environment, even though the face has changed, uh, face appearance has changed dramatically, and we can still successfully track those um, that person. And here is a, a more a, there is a more interesting example. So this illustrates a very interesting failure case. You can see here the person gradually put the hand over his face, and then the model looks. Uh, really looks really confused, and and now you can see, even though the person show his face again, but the detector actually mistake the hand with the face. And why is that? So you may realize within this loop, we are updating the model, and the model will gradually drift to the new appearance of the object. Here is an example to show you this uh, process. As you can see that when the hand gradually covered the face and the picture of the hand gradually dominate the positive examples of, those, of the online learned model. And the confidence of those pictures remain the same, which means that the model are becoming more and more confident that the hand is the track the face instead of the original face. And therefore, when the face appeared again, we are um, just mistake the hand with the face. The model drift turns out to be a very nasty problem. And fortunately, we have a very simple cure for it. We can turn to something we are really confident about, and that is our ground truth on the first frame, or the object we use to build the initial model. And because of uh, our confidence, and because it's absolutely correct, we can always use it to anchor or crack our model, so to avoid the model drift. So basically, uh, we can use our uh, initial uh, model and then fix it and um, build, use it to balance the results of our current model. And here is the demonstration of doing that. You can see that we uh, intentionally confuse the model with a similar pattern. So here, uh, we talk about that in the case of tracking by model, we can e even using online learning to adjust the appearance model so that it can gradually adapt to the uh, to the scene.
and some in addition to the information we have in addition to the information we have talked about, we can also use location information to smooth out the trajectory so that by using some assumption in terms of how the target object moves, we can track it and model its trajectory more accurately. And usually we find that a simple constant velocity heuristic can go a long way, especially when our camera is stationary. And But for more complicated motion, uh, we need to predict that whether uh, predict where the object will be in the future time step. And when we observe its uh, location, it, it may, the observation may suffer some noise, and we need to find a way to filter that noise. And at the same time, we may want to dispute, disambiguate multiple objects. The main technique we have been used for many decades is called common filter. The idea is actually very simple. First of all, we start with a prior knowledge of our state, like where the, our object is. And then, on the, as the prediction step, we will first predict that where it may be in the future. And at, at the future time step, we will have some more measurement or observation about where the object actually is. And we will use that observation to update our prediction to get a combination for the for the output estimate. So the goal here is that we can use our prediction to reduce the noise of our uh, measurement, and then we can easily update, uh, perform this step. Basically, with the current knowledge of the state, we predict what may, what may be the future, and then observe the observe the future state, fuse the state uh, observation with our prediction. To, prof to update our internal state and then um, and then make the next step. Uh, interestingly, this uh, common filter is a legacy of ETH. So the author of the common filter um, is a, used to be a professor at ETH and he has been awa awarded the National Medal of Science by uh, President <laughs> Obama. And it's one of the highest uh, award for researchers in the U.S. And yes, in summary, we can use also use location information to track the object. We have spent a lot of time on tracking a template or tracking a target object representing by a bounding box, and now let's talk about some more about how we can track some uh, articulated objects. Basically, um, there will be finer grained motion models that we can use in order to check in order to track those articulated objects. And uh, traditionally, we can build a uh, part-based models to rep represent the articulated objects. And you know, um, there are a lot of objects that uh, can articulate in the world. But uh, for, for us, probably uh, the most applicable model is the motion model or articulated model for human parts. And uh, very, like decades ago, uh, we have already built a very new model of our objects. Basically, we propose that we for each part of the articulated objects, we have a, a model itself. And then we use each component to represent the part. And then we use structure or to represent the relation between different parts. And we uh, have proposed that we can use some spring model to represent the parts. And there has been some uh, quite a lot of literature in computer vision, discussing how we can adjust the stre strengths of those strings that connect the parts. And that is kind of out of scope of this part of work. 
But <coughs> in any case, we can combine the spray model with our tracking, so that uh, we can we can track the part, track the accurate parts in a video. The basic idea is we can first locate the objects, and then for each each located object, we can track them together, just as with what we have already discussed. However, uh, in order to track uh, the articulated model, we can uh, analyze the articulation in each frame individually. And then when we link those articulated models with the track track tracks, uh, we can build we can build uh, the articulated model in the time domain. Uh, here is another example. So as you can see, uh, in this setup, uh, we do not consider the time domain or the temporary information for that uh, part. Then the question comes us in terms of video tracking, how we can make use of the temporary information in order to improve tracking or in other ways. What kind of uh, temporary information we can discover through tracking? And it's actually very important, very interesting. If we think about how people walk, say when people, someone is walking in the street, there's actually a periodical degree of freedom in terms of regular walking, and it's actually very easy to learn. First of all, uh, we can obtain a lot of those walking data by using uh, by using motion capture device. So we can uh, put uh, put someone in the controlled environment and observe it through those motion capture uh, setup you can see in the background and find out like what is the 3D motion of the different parts. And then we indeed is verify that uh, at a high frequency, the moving of the parts is in, um, in a circle. Either, either we track the skeleton or cell light of the, uh, of the person. And uh, if we look at a very low frequency movement of the person, is even in a, it's even constrained in a small area of this circle. And make it, by using this information, we can actually track the um, walking per person or pedestrians in the environment more reliably. So, so far, uh, we have talked about that, how we can track the objects um, with different setup. And when we are given a simply a point of template origin, and we can have a good initial guess about the uh, tracks or the translation or the motion parameter, we can easily use our iterative updates method to tra track the objects very efficiently within the image. Or we can use a model based methods either to locate the objects uh, belong to a certain category, or we can use a model to easily update uh, the information about the target objects by utilizing more and more tracked objects and update our appearance model. And in, additional, in addition to those appearance and um, like image-based comparison, we can also use location information to improve our tracking capability. At the same time, when we track the, the objects across frames, we can also do a fine grain analysis. For example, we can track articulated objects. And of course, when we uh, use those methods in real applications, we will face a lot of practical issues. And those practical issues also change when we have different type of models, especially uh, we have very dramatic change brought by deep learning methods. And we will discuss more about how we can use those tracking uh, models and tracking methods in practice 
when we discuss the deep learning approaches for those challenges.